Okay, thank you, David. I hope the microphone is working reasonably well. So it's a great honor to be here to give the Cowley Distinguished Lecture. And I'm very grateful to everyone who's turned up here in person as well. So the title is very general, Exploring the Nano World with Electrons. And what I'll try to do is to show some unusual uh, phenomena and properties of materials that can be measured in an electron microscope. And just as a teaser, first of all, I'd like to show three pictures at the top of this introductory slide. First of all, this grayscale image with a large plus and minus sign. And second, this uh, colored image with some black contour lines on it. And then a third image which shows a three-dimensional pattern nanostructure. And these are just teaser images, which I'll come back to during the talk, and I'll explain exactly what each of them is. But the main topic of the talk is in situ transmission electron microscopy, specifically to study functional properties and dynamic processes in materials. And I will focus on two different types of experiment. One involves studying the switching of phase change memory cells, very small nanoscale electronic devices in the electron microscope. And the second topic is topological magnetic spin textures and their properties investigated with electrons. But the aim throughout will be to illustrate what we can do at the moment in an electron microscope that can be bought commercially, leading towards what we're trying to do now, which is developing instrumentation and techniques and trying to decide on future directions for developing instrumentation, techniques, uh, and extending electron microscopy beyond what you can do with uh, off-the-shelf instruments that are available in, in most laboratories currently. But this is a lecture which is named after John Cowley, so I thought I would at least say a few words by way of introduction. For those of you who are here in ASU, you may have seen uh, a plaque on the wall with a picture of John Cowley and a few words which describe his unique uh, skills as a scientist, also his humility, the way in which he brought people together, and also uh, his outstanding skills as a teacher. John Cowley also wrote a very prominent book, which was call, called Diffraction Physics, uh, which many of us uh, studied in great detail and used as the basis for many of our, uh, our work in electron microscopy. From my side, even though I was working here in 1997 and 1998, primarily with David Smith and Molly McCartney, I had the privilege of working with John Cowley for a year. And uh, the topic of my work with John Cowley was the use of atomic columns typically atomic columns of gold atoms to focus electrons to improve the resolution of imaging other materials with electrons that have been focused by columns of atoms. This was known as atomic focuses. And this is the first page of the notes that John Cowley gave me when I started to work with him. Uh, so this was uh, a very uh, influential or transformative time for me. And I'm very grateful to John for being able to work with him. I should also mention that it's a nice coincidence that now in 2023 is 100 years since the birth of John Cowley. And that also means that it's 20 years since his 80th birthday celebration, which happened in 20, uh, 2003. You might notice Peter Crozier, John Wheatley and Jimmy Liu in the picture here with John. And here is another picture taken on the same uh, occasion with John and David. <clears throat> 
And it also means that it's 30 years since the first time I came to Arizona State University for the 70th birthday of John Cowley. That was, uh, again, a very productive conference held in Scottsdale. Uh, but I also remember it because that was the year of extreme weather in Arizona. And during the conference, the new bridge on Mill Avenue was swept away by floods. And you, uh, you can see the difference because there are no buildings on the other side of the river there yet. And the extreme weather also extended further north in Arizona. And uh, so immediately after the conference, we drove to the Grand Canyon. We drove around a barrier which said road closed. And we were the only people on the road between Flagstaff and the Grand Canyon. Uh, and there are four of us with Peter Nellis, Martin Haidt and Chris Boothroyd. We were the only people in Grand Canyon Village uh, that year when the road was closed. So these are some of my memories of John and uh, the, uh, the different uh, anniversaries since, uh, uh, since I've known him. So as David mentioned, uh, since I worked here in ASU, I've worked in four different places, three different countries, and I now work in a place called Ulich in Germany. This is a map of Germany. Ulich is marked with the red circle on the, left, on the left hand side. It's part of an association called the Helmholtz Association in Germany, which operates large research centers. It's physically in the middle of a forest. That forest is miles from anywhere because it's a former nuclear research facility. And that also means it's quite a good location for electron microscopy with no stray fields and not too many vibrations. Uh, but you really have to want to go there to be able to find the research center. Nevertheless, it's, uh, it has seven and a half thousand people on site in the middle of nowhere in Germany. And the Ernst Ruska Center, which is named after uh, one of the first uh, scientists who developed the electron microscope, Ernst Ruska. Uh, this is one of 50 departments in the Ulich Research Center. Uh, this is the building where we have electron microscopes. The two towers contain two of the largest microscopes, and we currently operate seven aberration corrected instruments, and the Institute has been working as a user facility for 18 years. Towards the end of the talk, I'll come back and I'll explain the directions in which the Institute is going. Um, but to begin with, I wanted to show a picture of the flagship electron microscope, which we currently operate. This is uh, not just a double corrected, electro double aberration corrected microscope. It has a combined chromatic and spherical aberration corrector to improve the spatial resolution even at low accelerating voltages. So it's one of the highest spatial resolution, conventional high resolution transmission electron microscopes anywhere. Uh, it's taller than a normal microscope of this type because it has the special aberration correctors in it. But just like any other transmission electron microscope, you have an electron gun at the top. Electrons are fired at about half the speed of light, focused with electromagnetic lenses onto a thin sample. They pass through the sample, which is typically between a few nanometers and a few hundred nanometers thick. There are more electromagnetic lenses and detectors. And the great power of electron microscopy is that you can record images, diffraction patterns, or spectra from very localized regions nowadays with, with atomic or subatomic spatial resolution. So with this microscope, you can record images with about 45 picometers, 0.45 angstrom spatial resolution at 200 kilovolts accelerating voltage. These, this is in conventional high resolution TEM imaging mode. In other words, this is an interference image formed by unscattered and scattered electrons. The only thing I'll say is that the higher the resolution in this kind of imaging mode, the thinner the sample has to be and the sample is only about three to four nanometers thick in this case for the image to be directly interpretable at this spatial resolution. This is a sample of cerium doped yttrium aluminium perovskite imaged in a particular orientation where some of the spacings uh, require 45 picometer spatial resolution to be resolved. But I wanted to show this image because 
these kind of conventional high resolution transmission electron microscope images are phase contrast images, and they involve using a combination of aberrations and defocus to convert phase changes into amplitude or intensity changes recorded on detectors. And phase contrast nowadays is very powerful, especially with scanning transmission electron microscopy methods, for example, tychography or differential phase contrast imaging. But it's also uh, a technique which I'll come back to a little bit later uh, when I talk about imaging topological magnetic textures. I wanted to begin with a simpler example. And the simpler example involves trying to image an operating nanoelectronic device in situ in the electron microscope. And this is not so straightforward, partly because the sample in the electron microscope has to be particularly small and particularly thin. And if you want to make an electrically contacted device, which is uh, also has multiple stimuli which are being used to change its properties or to induce switching processes, then all of that has to be accomplished within a very small space, a very small volume of space in the electron microscope. Typically, the whole piece gap in an electron microscope is just a few millimeters tall, and the sample, at least the region of interest in the sample, is often only, is often on the micron or even submicron scale. So the idea here is to look at so-called resistive switching-based phase change memory cells. And here we want to look at a device which can be switched either electrically or optically between amorphous or crystalline states. And these are small memory cells, which in, the in principle operate with very low power. They're non-volatile. Uh, they can they have a fast response time, and they can either be programmed to have uh, states which can be thought of as ones and zeros, or they can have intermediate states uh, which allow them to be used for some kind of brain-inspired or neuromorphic computing uh, when, they, when they can act almost like artificial synapses. But uh, these small devices are often on the tens of nanometer or hundreds, hundreds of nanometer scale. And we'd like to understand how the switching process between amorphous and crystalline states works very locally, close to atomic spatial resolution, and to understand how these switching processes affect the performance of the device. So a typical phase change memory cell consists of two electrical contacts with a material of interest in between. And the idea is to be able to use either uh, a short high power current or laser pulse to switch the device to an amorphous state or a low power longer uh, electrical or optical pulse to switch it back to a crystalline state. Um, and as I mentioned, you only need two electrodes. Uh, the switching process is fast, it's non-volatile, and you can create intermediate states in between simple amorphous or crystalline uh, states of the whole device. And in this sense, it's uh, more promising than some other types of memory, for example, in flash memory, where you need three electrodes, where the lifetime of the state can be shorter and which are slower for uh, switching processes. But as I mentioned, we would like to understand what is happening on the atomic scale uh, what is limiting the switching kinetics, and there are specific phenomena which are, which are referred to as thresh, threshold switching or resistance drift, which are not understood at the moment. But these are, of course, challenging because we would like to combine electrical contacting of a very small, almost nanometer scale device with high spatial resolution imaging in an electron microscope column. Um, and uh, we would like to see what is happening grain by grain or almost atom by atom in the material. The phenomenon of threshold switching, which I mentioned, uh, this occurs in the amorphous phase in, uh, in these materials. And that describes changes in the conductivity of the amorphous material when the voltage is applied to the device. The phenomenon of uh, resistance drift 
uh, also involves uh, the amorphous material in a device, and that that uh, describes changes in the volume uh, of amorphous regions. Uh, again, something which can be studied by cycling the device and seeing how the amorphous regions evolve over time. So here the challenges are considerable. We need very short switching times, typically on the tens of nanosecond scale. Um, so we need a very special sample geometry, which works in the electron microscope, but we also need to be able to apply currents to a device which has no heat sink underneath it so that we can look through it in the electron microscope. And that means we need, we need additional layers to stop the device from evaporating from uh, resistive heating as a current is passed through it inside the electron microscope during observation. And so the solutions to be able to do an experiment like this involve, first of all, redesigning a sample holder so that it's correctly impedance matched for uh, studies with very short current pulses. And the sample holders are typically long rods with uh, a small sample on the very end. Making dedicated MEMS chips, which allow the devices to be operated outside the microscope and inside the microscope, adding extra layers to the device to stop them evaporating when a current is passed through them, and then developing specific imaging modes, which allow the amorphous and crystalline regions in a thin layer to be imaged with high contrast, even when there are other protective layers above and below them. And that requires some further data analysis. So the entire stack looks something like this. There's an electron transparent region in the middle. The red layer here is the active switching device. It's labeled AIST. This is antimony, indium, tin, tellurium. Uh, and then there are additional protective layers and underlayers and overlayers of silicon nitride to protect the device during switching. If you look at it in a scanning electron microscope, then at low magnification, the device looks like the image on the left. There are gold contact pads and there are gray regions, which are the uh, regions of the phase change material, which are getting narrower and narrower. And then the small red box, which is enlarged on the right hand side, shows the device uh, at high magnification and the very small narrow constriction in the very center of the image, which is just 300 nanometers tall and just about 50 nanometers wide, is the device itself, which we want to examine during switching in the electron microscope. And at even higher magnification, this is an annular dark field scanning in TEM mode, we see the image on the top right, and now we see the device itself, the AIST memory cell, about 300 nanometers across, about 50 nanometers tall, with the crystalline contacts on the left and on the right, and the arrows show the direction in which we're passing a current through the device. And here we want to study the transformation of this little memory cell in the middle between amorphous and crystalline states step by step. So if we optimize the imaging conditions, in other words, we set up a very specific range of scattering angles, which is sensitive to the difference between the amorphous regions and the crystalline regions, we can in fact see the transition from the amorphous state to the crystalline state in a spatially resolved manner. So the image on the top left shows the pristine device, which is fully crystalline. And then in the electron microscope, it's possible to apply a very short 50 nanosecond current pulse and the region which is marked in red becomes amorphous. It has slightly different contrast. And then you apply slightly longer current pulses in sequence, crystalline regions start to grow. They're outlined in blue here. And then you can switch it back to the amorphous state with shorter current pulses and back to the crystalline state again with longer current pulses. Something which is a little bit curious is the fact that if we change the polarity of the device, and this is the image which I showed on the first slide, uh, then as you change the polarity of the device, the amorphous region typically switches between the left contact and the right contact in a reproducible manner. So this is still a bit of a mystery, but the hypothesis is that this is something called the Thomson effect, which is a combination of heating and voltage, which results in uh, this asymmetry between where the amorphous region forms. But because we're using an electron microscope, we, we, can not only, we not only have the ability to record images, we have the ability to record diffraction patterns point by point. 
And here, in, with the labels A, B, and C, these are diffraction patterns from three regions in the amorphous uh, part of the device, which show no diffraction spots. And then the spots labeled one, two, and three are spots from the crystalline regions of the device, which show that the crystalline grains are in different orientations in different regions of the device. And of course, what you can do is you can do this point by point across the entire field of view, and then you can use data analysis approaches to, first of all, denoise the results, then to use principal component analysis and non-negative matrix factorization to group together diffraction patterns which correspond to the same orientations. You can then merge those components corresponding to different orientations, uh, and then you can create masks uh, which can be used to label which parts of the original image correspond to the same crystalline orientation. And in this way, it's possible to look at the device and uh, to, first of all, label in light blue the regions which are crystalline, in dark blue the regions which are amorphous, pixel by pixel across the field of view, going from low resistance states to high resistance states and back again and to see whether the amorphous region forms reproducibly in the same place. But it's also possible to group together regions which have the same crystalline orientations and uh, mark them in different colors, and to see whether the crystalline regions grow in the same orientation from one cycle to the next, and in this way to try to understand the switching process with nanometer or sub-nanometer spatial resolution in a nanoscale device. So I show this partly because the experimental challenges to do an experiment like this are quite considerable already. But uh, also uh, because I wanted to highlight the fact this, that this is approximately the state of the art of what we can do at the moment. But it still leaves many questions unanswered. Uh, for example, we'd like to cycle the device millions of times rather than just a few times. We'd like to automate experiments. We'd like to understand the influence of the local electric field on the switching process. We'd like to understand how the device changes chemically across individual interfaces during switching. And we would like to understand the phenomena that I introduced before, resistance drift, threshold switching, uh, again, by cycling the device as many times. We'd also like to be able to switch the device optically rather than electrically, and we'd like to look at more complicated materials, perhaps two-dimensional materials in the same way. So these are open questions at the moment, but I wanted to show this example as uh, an initial um, study which, uh, which highlights what you can do with uh, imaging and diffraction of uh, local changes in crystallinity and in microstructure of materials. But I wanted this to lead into the second topic, and this is imaging not the microstructure or the chemical composition or the defect state, but really trying to image how devices are operating on a functional level. And here, the topic I've chosen is topological magnetic spin textures, specifically magnetic skirmions. And this is a fashionable topic nowadays, uh, partly because magnetic skirmions, which are small vortex-like magnetic spin textures, are of interest for possible applications in future racetrack-like devices for uh, low-power energy-efficient magnetic storage or computing applications, or perhaps for logic devices. But they're also very interesting objects in their own right. They are particle-like objects, which are created from continuous fields, which interact with each other, uh, almost like physical objects, even though they are just created from uh, magnetic fields. So in order to study magnetic skirmions, we need to be able to image magnetic fields in the electron microscope. And this can be done in two different ways. It can be done spectroscopically by using electron dichroism, which is very similar to X-ray dichroism, and this is sensitive to the component of magnetization in the sample in the direction of the incident electron beam, or 
magnetic uh, fields can be studied with phase contrast techniques. And here I come back to uh, phase contrast techniques, which I originally introduced through high resolution atomic resolution imaging. But here we use them to image uh, more slowly varying continuous fields, in this case, magnetic fields, but also we can use them to image variations in electrostatic potential. So nowadays, some of the most fashionable techniques for imaging magnetic fields are STEM techniques, in particular, uh, what, are, what are known as 4D STEM techniques, including tychographic techniques uh, with electrons. But traditionally, uh, in our institute, we've used Lorentz imaging and the TEM technique of off-axis electron holography to image magnetic fields. And so I'll show results obtained using these techniques. However, I won't concentrate too much on the techniques themselves. Everything I show that was recorded with holography applies equally well to results which could have been obtained using other techniques like tychography. So uh, I won't say too much about electron holography, but I will say that this is a technique which I was taught by Molly McCartney when I was working here in 1997 and 1998. It simply involves using uh, what's termed an electron biprism to interfere electrons which pass outside a sample with electrons that pass through a sample to form an interference pattern on the detector plane on top of what looks like a bright field image of the sample. For magnetic materials, the sample is usually imaged either in magnetic field-free conditions or in a small uh, pre-calibrated field applied to the sample. But the reason the technique is so powerful is that just like with tychography, it allows the phase shift of the electron wave in the electron microscope to be measured directly. And the phase shift is sensitive to electrostatic potentials, but it's also sensitive to magnetic fields, and in particular to the component of the magnetic vector potential inside the sample and outside the sample integrated in the electron beam direction. The details of exactly how the technique works are not so important. I wanted to concentrate on results that we obtain using this technique all, I, all I'll say is that it's a way of imaging magnetic fields uh, quantitatively in the electron microscope, but uh, I'll mention a few complications and a few subtleties as I present results from magnetic skirmions. So I mentioned that magnetic skirmions are vortex-like spin textures, which form either in crystallographically chiral crystal line materials, which can be bulk materials, or they can be thin films, or they form in multi-layers of typically combinations of ferromagnetic materials and high atomic number materials because of interfacial effects. In the simplest form, they can be split into what are termed block-type skirmions and nail-type skirmions, and in most materials, these skirmions are typically between 50 and 100 nanometers in size. With block type skirmions, you have spins which are pointing anti parallel to the applied field, which fall into the plane azimuthally. With nail type skirmions, they fall into the plane radially. The difference is that with most TEM imaging techniques, nail type skirmions produce no observable phase contrast until the nail type skirmions are tilted whereas block type skirmions produce phase contrast when they're imaged untilted in the electron microscope. This is in itself an interesting mathematical curiosity why, why this happens, but I'll focus mainly on block type skirmions, which are the easier types of materials to study. I say easy, I say easy but they're not so easy to study because for most materials, uh, studies of skirmions in, require cooling a sample in the electron microscope and then applying an external field to generate uh, either individual skirmions or lattices of skirmions. Uh, for the material which, uh, from which I'll illustrate results, this is an alloy of iron germanium. You have to cool the sample with liquid nitrogen and you have to apply an external field to the sample 
and then you have a region of stability of the skirmions in between what is termed a helical state and a ferromagnetic state. Uh, for cooling the sample, we normally use a liquid nitrogen, uh, a liquid nitrogen cooled sample holder, and this is a simple holder uh, from the company Gatan, uh, which has liquid nitrogen dewer, and uh, the sample is still sitting at the end of this uh, long rod, which uh, enters the electron microscope. And I'm showing this holder because I'll come back a little bit later to a different holder design, which we're currently working on. But I wanted to go through a few different types of magnetic textures because I wanted to show, first of all, the power of electron microscopy for imaging uh, complicated magnetic states with very high spatial resolution. But also I wanted to illustrate some of the complications and some of the re reasons we want to develop the techniques further. So with magnetic skirmions, I wanted to go through a few examples of skirmions in confined geometries some skirmions that contain magnetic singularities, some skirmions that form more complicated superstructures or textures, and some skirmions that have mixed block type and nail type characters. And I'll go through each example relatively quickly. So first of all, uh, I wanted to go back to one of the motivations which I first mentioned, which is that skirmions are of interest for racetrack-like geometries where skirmions May be, con may be confined in the future to narrow tracks of, material, tracks of material and can be used to encode bits of information as either ones or zeros. So at the top is a normal bright field image of a small pattern track of crystalline iron germanium, which is about 100 nanometer thick in the electron beam direction coming into the plane of the screen. It's 150 nanometers tall on the right and about 45 nanometers tall on the left. And the significance of these dimensions is that on the right hand side, it's a little bit bigger than the size of an individual skirmion and on the left, it's a little bit smaller. So we'd like to see how a, a track affects the nucleation uh, of skirmions when it's approximately the same size as the skirmions themselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to cool the sample, this very narrow track of material, we're going to take holograms, we're going to extract phase images, and then we're going to put contours onto the phase images to try to image the magnetic field. What we get when we do this is a set of magnetic states which look like this. And this is the imaging the magnetic field directly with nanometer spatial resolution in the electron microscope. Uh, this is holographically, but the same thing could be done typographically. This is all at 220 Kelvin. The top row is in zero applied field. And this is what is known as a helical magnetic state where in most cases, the magnetic field points in opposite directions. In some cases, it's a little bit more complicated, but the great power of this imaging technique is that you can see the magnetic state all the way to the very edge of this track. This would be very difficult with uh, some other imaging techniques, even in the electron microscope. And in the presence of an applied field, 148 millitesla or 222 millitesla applied in the out of plane direction, you form a single row of skirmions and then you start to form a zigzag row of skirmions. You know they're skirmions because there are some additional uh, magnetic features in the texture. For example, you see this very narrow red band, you see this narrow, very narrow green band here. These are known as edge twists and they only appear in crystallographically chiral materials which form skirmions, not other materials which have more normal vortex-like textures. So here we see that the skirmions are elongated vertically on the right-hand side, and they're squashed vertically on the left-hand side. So it's direct imaging of the effect of confinement on uh, the formation of individual skirmions. But immediately you see a problem here. And the problem is that a magnetic field is inherently three-dimensional. It's a vector field. And we're using a two-dimensional detector to record a three-dimensional vector field. So what are we actually recording? So in a single image like this, it turns out we're recording the, in, the components of the magnetic flux density perpendicular to the electron beam direction projected 
in the electron beam direction. We're not recording all the information about the three-dimensional vector field. And this is something which I'll come back to a little bit later. But first of all, I wanted to illustrate some of the other slightly more complicated magnetic textures, which I mentioned. So first of all, uh, magnetic singularities. So magnetic skirmions are traditionally straight strings of this vortex-like texture, which pass all the way through a thin sample. In the previous example, it was 100 nanometers thick. But in some cases, they can terminate in the middle of the sample at magnetic singularities or magnetic block points. And it turns out that these, uh, through following a very careful sequence of uh, how the sample is cooled and how the external field is applied, it's possible to nucleate these uh, textures which have singularities, which are now termed magnetic bobbers. And they actually, these are phase images recorded holographically, and they appear as objects which are the same size as skirmions, but which have weaker contrast. And that contrast corresponds exactly to what you would expect if the singularity occurred somewhere close to the middle of the sample. It's an example of three-dimensional magnetic object uh, in a thin TEM sample. But in fact, there can be more complicated uh, the scale bar. So each of these skirmions is about 70 nanometers across. But in fact, uh, you can form more complicated magnetic textures. For example, our colleagues who uh, perform theoretical calculations predicted that if you have a sample of a certain thickness, and again, you cool it and you apply fields in a certain sequence, these straight magnetic skirmions can twist around each other to form rope-like textures or braids. And the question is whether we can see this experimentally or not. And again, based on the simulations, we can follow a specific sequence of cooling the sample and applying fields. And we can, in fact, record images. These are Lorentz images, out of focus images recorded at two different values of applied field, under focus and over focus. And at a certain value of applied field, you have six separated uh, straight magnetic skirmion strings. You change the applied field very slightly, and they rearrange into this pentagonal arrangement. And comparisons with simulations show that this is exactly what you would expect if these skirmion strings were twisting around each other into a rope-like structure, all on the basis of simulations which are used to design experiments, which are used to verify the predictions. And then you can go even further because instead of magnetic singularities or straight skirmion strings, you can also predict more three-dimensional textures, which are knotted versions of, uh, of skirmions. Um, in the simplest case, you can form a donut shape in the middle of the sample, but you can also have these donuts interlinking with each other and more complicated knotted magnetic textures. Um, you can think of them as three-dimensional versions of skirmions which loop around inside the sample. Uh, they're classified by something which is called a Hopf index, and they're termed Hopfions. And the simplest version, uh, this Hopfion with, an, with a Hopf index of two, had never been reproducibly nucleated in an extended thin film before. So again, on the basis of predictions of how to cool the sample and how to apply a range of fields and how to choose the correct thickness, uh, we uh, first of all predicted that you can form one of these donut-shaped hopfions with magnetic skirmion strings inside it with different numbers of skirmion strings inside. And then this is exactly what you obtain experimentally. Again, these are under-focus and over-focus images, experiments on the left, theory on the right, straight skirmion strings in the middle, and this very narrow ring around the outside. And this is this hopfion, which is confining these straight skirmion strings an extremely complicated three-dimensional magnetic object, but it requires a combination of theory simulations to be able to design the experiments, to be able to observe it. And because we're looking in transmission, this is something which could not be observed with any surface sensitive magnetic technique. Okay, so there's a, a last example which I wanted to show, and this is from another confined structure. And in this case, if instead of a single track of material, you make a little cylinder and you look down the axis of the cylinder, then you can confine a single skirmion in the middle and then an edge twist spinning in the opposite direction. 
everything looks very simple, very straightforward, until you tilt the sample about the horizontal axis and you start to look at the magnetic state from the side. This is at quite a high tilt angle of 65 degrees. And suddenly you see that this magnetic state in three dimensions is extremely complicated. It's complicated for a few different reasons. One, because it's a mixture of a block type texture and a nail type texture, and the nail te type texture is often invisible, depending on what direction you look at it. But the second reason is because this little cylinder is affected by preparing by preparation using focused iron beam preparation, and the magnetic properties change from the middle of the sample to the edge. And this really affects what the three dimensional texture looks like. So these are still projections onto different in different directions. It's not imaging the three dimensional texture directly. But this all leads into how do we actually image the three dimensional vector field directly? And again, this is not so straightforward. Um, and it all depends on what, exactly what you're trying to measure. If you do want to measure the three dimensional representation of the magnetic flux density B, then there is a way of doing this, but there's an, there's, a, there's an extra complication. And this is the fact that if you are imaging magnetic skirmions, normally when you perform a tomographic experiment to image an object in three dimensions, then you need to tilt about a single axis. For reconstructing a vector field in three dimensions, you need to tilt about two axes. But in the case of skirmions, you also need to cool the sample and you need to subject it to an external field as it's being tilted. So together with colleagues in the Leibniz Institute in Dresden, we managed to realize this experiment. And this was done in a very specific way by looking, taking a needle-shaped sample of iron germanium, putting it in the middle of a ring of hard magnetic samarium cobalt, magnetizing the samarium cobalt out of the plane, and then cooling the entire sample with liquid nitrogen so that it could be cooled, it could be tilted at low temperature, but the stray field of the samarium cobalt ring, which acts on the needle shaped sample, tilts together with the needle as the tomographic experiment is being carried out. And this can be done about different tilt axes. And in this way, a vector field can be reconstructed in three dimensions. And here on the right hand side, these are skirmions image slice by slice through a needle where you can see how the block type texture changes as it gets towards the end of the needle, how it changes from one skirmion to the next, and how it's affected by the surfaces and by the geometry of the sample in three dimensions. So this is imaging the magnetic induction B in three dimensions, but I wanted to mention one final point, which is the fact that sometimes we don't want to image the magnetic induction B, sometimes we want to image the magnetization M. And this is in fact an ill-posed inverse problem. And it's an ill-posed inverse problem because with phase contrast techniques, we record some kind of phase images, typographically or holographically, but there are different magnetic objects which can produce exactly the same phase contrast. So the question is how we solve this problem. And it turns out that there is a brute force way of doing this by guessing the magnetization distribution inside the sample, iterating that magnetization distribution until the best fit is obtained with one or more experimental phase images, but introducing additional constraints, for example, a smoothness constraint, and the additional constraints, which are included as regularization parameters, in fact, uh, constrain the solution so it is more unique. This can be done either in projection or in three dimensions. And the reason this is important in projection is shown in this example. On the left is a phase image of a skirmion lattice in a parallel sided film. In the middle is a magnetic induction map just created by putting contours and colors onto the original phase image. But if you apply this inversion algorithm to reconstruct the in-plane magnetization in projection, you end up with the image on the right, which looks nothing like the image on the left. The fact uh, the projected magnetization is completely different from the projected magnetic flux density. So if you want to image the source of the magnetic field, the magnetic moments, then you actually have to go through this procedure and uh, it all depends on what you're trying to reconstruct inside the sample. And in this way, you can follow 
you can the different uh, how the how the skirmions involve as magnetic moments as a function of applied field and as a function of temperature quantitatively as magnetic moments and you can do the same thing in three dimensions but you as input you use an entire tilt series of images but i won't go through uh, any examples of reconstructing the three-dimensional distribution of m and i just wanted to go back to the uniqueness of the problem um, the uniqueness there is a uniqueness problem in reconstructing magnetic fields, and this comes back to this problem that I mentioned with the nail type skirmions. There are some magnetic textures which you can emit, which will produce no phase contrast in whatever direction you look at them. And also in the presence of noise, you can't always reconstruct a magnetic object which is consistent with both the signal and the noise. So somehow you need to overcome these problems and the re regularization that process the additional information which I mentioned is a way of solving this uniqueness problem. So what is all this leading up to? So we'd like to take all these experiments further and um, eventually with uh, imaging magnetic textures we have a certain vision and the vision is to be able to look at a real magnetic device which may be a neuro-inspired magnetic device that contains three-dimensional distributions of magnetic hopfions, which are created and then manipulated electrically or optically, read out electrically or optically, but also imaged in three dimensions, not only, not only in three dimensions, not only in real time, but also in a time-resolved manner. And they move on, they move extremely quickly. So how are we doing this at the moment? Well, uh we are trying to move towards more stable cooling of the sample in the presence of uh better controlled external stimuli and we are trying to develop instruments further to make cleaner environments to automate workflows and to improve other components for example specimen stages so recently we've done this in two ways uh, we've rebuilt one of our existing electron microscopes by uh, adding components like helium flow cryostats, new magnetizing stages, beam blankers, microwave equipped sample holders, and improved detectors and automation software. And we now have a microscope which has light injection at the position of the sample. It has two helium flow cryostats. It has an extra section of column for... Uh, uh, blanking the beam extremely quickly. It has an extremely crowded pole piece now uh, where you have a sample, you have a transfer rod, you have retractable cryo blades, you have a MEMS aperture strip, you have a light injection system, you have a light collection system, and all of this can be inserted and removed in, in any combination. And together with a small company, Condon Zero, we are uh, first of all trying to design a new type of liquid helium cooled sample holder which uh, cools the sample very quickly, which has a long uh, holding time at low temperature. And secondly, uh, we are bringing in liquid helium in another direction to try to uh, bring in additional components into the microscope column, which also require helium cooling in different ways. So the microscope is now becoming increasingly complicated. In addition to the light injection system, the microscope is connected to two helium dewars. One of the helium dewars brings helium in directly to the sample holder. Uh, the sample holder is now very light. It doesn't have its own dewar attached to it. And it has a very flexible connection system with its own heater to prevent vibrations being transferred from the helium flow cryostat. And the result is that in a matter of two to five minutes, we can go down to five Kelvin and we have a holding time at low temperature at five Kelvin of more than 24 hours. And we can now image magnetic skirmions, helical magnetic states or magnetic uh, or magnetic skirmions in this case in applied fields at five Kelvin very quickly in a stable way. And I just wanted to mention that these are magnetic fields. There's, uh, we can also image electrostatic potentials. This is a little latex bead imaged uh, at room temperature and at five Kelvin, and the latex bead charges up in the electron beam and it charges up more at five Kelvin. This is the projected electrostatic potential. 
but it also highlights the fact that we see some unexpected effects at low temperature. If instead we look at normal images of the sample at room temperature and at five Kelvin, at five Kelvin, the little latex bead has a dark rim around it. And this is probably condensed air, condensed nitrogen or oxygen in the column, because we're starting with a dirty column to begin with. And that disappears as soon as the sample warms up. But we have bigger ambitions. So in Germany, we've managed to put electron microscopy on the same funding stream as synchrotrons and satellites and telescopes. And we've now tried to overcome many of the limitations which I described by ordering a set of new instruments. And the new instruments are all ultra high vacuum electron microscopes, and they all go beyond what is available commercially. For example, we have a combined atom probe and TEM coming. We have a deep UHV electron microscope coming together with in situ deposition, pulsed laser deposition in the electron microscope and connectivity to surface science equipment and a number of other unique instruments which offer better temporal resolution, better spectroscopic sensitivity and better biological imaging capabilities. But beyond that, we also have a new European project, which has the title IMPRESS, Interoperable Electron Microscopy Platform for Advanced Research and Services. And this is another direction that we're going in in Europe, which is to try to obtain funding for developing new hardware and new software on the basis of open science principles. And in this project, we want to be able to uh, co-develop with small companies new components for electron microscope, all based on shared concepts. Um, the main column manufacturers cannot bid for this, uh, for the contracts in this project. The, all of the designs have to come from small companies and then the column manufacturers uh, will be told that they have to accept the designs which are based on open science concepts in order to retain their business advantage. So we're trying to overcome the current monopoly, the current problem of vendor lock-in in electron microscopy that prevents scientists from be being able to redevelop instruments themselves by introducing a new concept of building instrumentation based on open science principles in both hardware and software. And for this particular project in Europe, we have about 25 partners working together half electron microscopists, one third other infrastructures, including synchrotrons and uh, uh, some biological infrastructures. And the remaining partners are lawyers uh, in case we have problems with any of the vendors uh, in adopting the open science principles that are being developed during this project. And the final thing I wanted to mention is the third example, which I showed on the first slide on the first slides. And this is just more of a fun example uh, of uh, that we're also working on. Um, so the question is, what is this little device that I showed right at the very beginning? Well, it leads on from an initial idea, which was how do we image the magnetic field of a current in the electron microscope? And what we first did was to create a little three-dimensional circuit out of gold by patterning it. And then we connected both sides and the little bit in the middle, we oriented vertically before making a contact to it so that there is a current in the direction of the electron beam. And it turns out that again, using the techniques which I described previously, as you pass a current along this little element, then you can image the magnetic, the magnetic field from the little element of current. So you're imaging the magnetic field of a current directly. And in the future, if we'd like to be able to do this in a more reproducible way, we make this device where the current element is oriented vertically here. Now, why would we want to do this? Because what we have here is a small tunable face plate. And for example, if you want to increase the contrast of a weekly scattering sample, like a biological sample, you may want to put this device in the back focal plane. You may want to pass a current through the device that introduces a phase shift between the unscattered beam and the scattered beams. 
And in this case, if the device charges up at all, you just change the current passing through it and you have a tunable phase plate in the electron microscope. And if you want to make more complicated phase plates, you have many currents flowing in different directions and the magnetic fields of the different currents can introduce different tunable phase shifts in the electron microscope for electrons. So that's more or less what I want, where I wanted to end with this uh, range of examples of how you make small devices in the electron microscope and how you try to make them work and also future directions. And I've listed again the, some of the future directions, the future challenges and the future developments in instrumentation, which are required to achieve some of these uh, changes which we would like to introduce in electron microscopy. For example, eventually we would like to have full adaptive optics in the electron microscope, tunable phase plates, exchangeable components, and also uh, easy transfer of experiments to correlative techniques. And I'll just finish again with the example of the three-dimensional magnetic skirmions. This is about the best we can do at the moment, moment before we improve the microscopes further. I'd like to acknowledge a whole stack of people who um, were involved in the examples, uh, in the experiments uh, which I showed. And I'd like to finally acknowledge the different funding agencies which uh, funded the research, which I illustrated. Some of these are European funding agencies. And we also had some funding from DARPA as well uh, for some of the uh, magnetic switching experiments. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and for listening to the talk.